All right. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome everybody here today and to uh, introduce our speaker to the Homestead Colloquium, Marcy O'Malley. Uh, Marcy completed her undergraduate studies at Purdue University and then after that went on to do her PhD at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Um, when she was done with her PhD, she went to Rice and she's been there uh, since. Um, Marcy is, a, is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and she also has a joint appointment in the computer science department. She is also an adjunct at the Baylor College of Medicine in the Houston uh, Medical Center area, very close to Rice University, and also at the University of Texas um, Medical School in Houston. Um, after arriving at Rice, Marcy started off her career with two very prestigious uh, Young Investigator Awards, one from uh, ONR, the Office of Naval Research in the US, and the other from the National Science Foundation. Her talk today will be telling us quite a bit about her research, which I think is really exciting and fascinating. Uh, so I won't talk very much about that, but it's a real pleasure to introduce Marcy. Welcome. Thanks, Paul. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been wonderful to visit Sweden, my first time to Sweden. Um, and I've survived the cold. I guess it's in my blood. I grew up in Northeast Ohio. So this is, I tried to block that part of my experiences out of my memory, but um, it's, it's been quite lovely uh, to, to visit the area. Um, as Waleed mentioned, I'm going to discuss the three different sort of research thrusts within my lab today. Uh, but overall, the, the mission of our lab uh, at Rice is to design, manufacture, and test mechatronic or robotic systems that might be used to model or rehabilitate, enhance, or augment the human sensory motor control system. Um, so under sort of the broad theme of uh, mechatronics, dynamic systems, and controls, uh, I can sort of divide the various research efforts in the lab to the area of rehabilitation robotics, um, haptics, and teleoperation, which will be of a little bit less emphasis actually, I'm going to kind of hit all of this, and, and some skill assessment and training as well. Um, partially because of the proximity to the Texas Medical Center, a lot of our work has taken a, a medical focus, um, and you'll see that uh, in, in my examples. So here's the three uh, overall arching projects that I want to describe to you today. So the first is um, ensuring active engagement of the participant in therapeutic interventions with robotic devices. We do a lot of work in um, upper extremity rehabilitation after stroke and spinal cord injury. Um, and we've uh, evaluated some different mechanisms that we can use to ensure that the participant is engaged, intentfully engaged in their uh, therapeutic uh, treatment, which we know contributes to, to better outcomes. So I'll talk about some of the measures we're using for frequent feedback, um, some ideas behind the control architectures that we're using, and some very sort of hot off the presses work, um, literally paper submitted um, at about 7 a.m. this morning. Um, <laughs> on a compliant hardware design for interaction control. The second effort that I want to talk about is using haptic guidance or what we call shared control for training new skills in virtual environments. So both how we can analyze tasks to understand the important features of those tasks so we know what to train, and then also uh, selecting appropriate guidance architectures and algorithms to effectively transfer skill uh, to, to a, a novice user. And third, I'll talk about um, providing natural sensory feedback for smart prosthetics. Right, so let me start with the area of rehabilitation robotics. And as I mentioned, uh, we know from the neuroscience literature that to really get recovery and induce neuroplasticity, you really need the engagement of the subject. So for this effort, I'm going to do my acknowledgments in chunks. Um, so uh, a lot of funding both from uh, national uh, uh, you know, research foundations and from some more local uh, foundations, and then uh, with my collaborators at Baylor, Tier, Methodist, and uh, UT. So the benefits of robotic rehabilitation are that this repetitive practice can induce brain and spinal cord plasticity, um, and therefore result in significant upper limb improvements in terms of function. 
Robotic devices are really well suited for delivering this kind of intensive and repetitive therapy. If you think about you know, sort of the dawn of robotics back in the 60s for automation and manufacturing, let's let robots do all those automated, repetitive, boring tasks that the humans don't want to do. Well, this is exactly what will help induce plasticity uh, in stroke and spinal cord injury uh, rehabilitation. And so a lot of the uh, motivation be behind the delivery of physical therapy is to do these repetitive movements. So let's use robots to do those movements. Uh, we can do this controlled delivery. Uh, we can do it at high intensity and high repetition. We can maybe do it for multiple patients simultaneously. Uh, and then uh, as an added bonus, because we're using robotic devices, we can get quali uh, quantitative metrics about the motor coordination and performance of the subjects. So we can use those metrics to analyze uh, how they're performing. So let me start with that, and this is really where we began uh, in looking at, well, what could some of the advantages of robotic devices for rehabilitation be? And in our collaborations and conversations with the clinical partners, what we learned was that most assessment of therapy is done pre and post. So you would assess the sub, uh, participant when they come in, determine their baseline values. You might administer a therapy protocol that would last four weeks, six months, and then you would assess again at the end. And there may be some intervals, but the intervals of assessment are quite coarse. And part of the reason of that is that the um, assessment techniques can be time intensive and labor intensive. Right, so these clinical measures, uh, which are widely accepted by the clinical community and, and very uh, well validated and verified, um, known to be um, independent of task or procedure, uh, suffer from the fact that they're not always the most efficient to administer. And also, um, while they've been validated and shown that there's very little interoperable interoperator variability, there is still a dependency. So if Waleed were to administer a Fugelmeyer assessment and I were to administer a Fugelmeyer assessment, which would give you a score between 0 and 66, we might vary by a couple of points, which is quite a coarse uh, level of variation. So you need to see very large changes on these scales. Robotic measures are what we use to describe any kind of performance measure that we would derive from the quantitative data from the sensors on the robot. These can be very efficient to compute because we're just doing them as part of the control loop of the robot. They're quite objective, so no human intervention except, you know, as much as you can finagle the equations. Uh, but they're not widely accepted by the clinical community. There's no sort of intuition as to what these robotic measures might mean. And typically there's sort of for every rehab robot, there's a rehab, uh, there's a robotic measure of performance. And they tend to be very device specific or protocol specific, uh, dependent on the algorithm. Uh, and, and not a lot of consistency across groups. So we sought to sort of fill in these gaps on the robotic measures and see if we could come up with some uh, assessments that would have sort of better clinical relevance and might uh, move us in the direction of being uh, widely accepted. So this is where we started. This is about 2005. Uh, we got a, a, a little tiny bit of money. Uh, we modified a commercial haptic interface in our lab. This is the Immersion uh, 2000 uh, haptic joystick. We put a, a conical handle and, and ball assembly uh, to help with uh, grip for our subjects. They did what we uh, call the clock task, which basically there's a target at 12 o'clock and you move around the clock and back to center. So a center outreaching task, very typical for upper extremity assessment. And there's sort of a, a shot of one of our participants uh, at the interface. So we did a therapy protocol. We uh, enrolled nine uh, chronic stroke participants in this study. And they did a four week protocol where they came in like three times a week and did therapy for several hours. And we collected uh, a lot of data from, you know, we've got encoders on each of these degrees of freedom, so we collect that data. And we looked at how we could assess their performance. So on the clinical side, we selected four uh, clinical measures to look at. So one um, group of these measures assesses motor impairment. So sort of the degree of impairment uh, in, um, in motor uh, functional task execution, so not really tied to anything functional, but just a movement. So Fugelmeyer, the upper limb component, which gives us a score of 0 to 66. There's 33 different elements. It might measure range of motion, uh, strength, some other aspects, and you get rated a 0, 1, or 2. 0, you cannot complete or no evidence. 2, yes, check the box, and 1, somewhere in the middle. 
So this is where you get this coarseness. Uh, the action research arm test is a similar kind of scale uh, trying to assess uh, motor impairment. And then to contrast that, we selected uh, two clinical measures that measure functional use. The jepson taylor hand function test is, is a measurement of uh, task performance in time, six different tasks, um, stacking coins, uh, flipping cards, uh, very functional types of things that would map directly to activities of daily living. And your score is the amount of time that it takes you to complete these tasks. And then the motor activity log uh, which is a self-assessment by the participant and their caregiver on the amount of use and quality of use of the impaired limb. So six would be I used my impaired limb a lot this week and the quality of that use was maybe a five out of six, just a self-rated scale. On the robotic measure side, we were uh, trying to sort of capture the same sort of thing. Can we come up with measures that give us some idea of maybe the quality of the movement and some other measures that give us some idea of maybe the function or speed with which people can execute these movements? So uh, we went to the motor control literature for our inspiration on our, um, and, and a lot of the robotic rehab literature for our movement quality measures. So say this uh, crosshair here is the center of that clock task and the circle is the target. Uh, we know healthy individuals would make a straight line uh, mo movement uh, to that target. And if you look at the velocity profile of that straight line, uh, if you plot speed versus time, uh, it would be a bell-shaped uh, velocity profile that minimizes jerk. So it's an optimally smooth movement. This is the way uh, healthy individuals uh, execute movements. And, and here in the cartoon, we've got maybe an example of what we might observe with one of our uh, stroke impaired individuals. So they would have a trajectory that varies, it's not straight line, and we can measure the deviation from the desired trajectory. Uh, and that gives us a, an assessment of what we call trajectory error. And then this red dashed line would be the patient's velocity profile. And we can correlate their velocity profile to what we would observe in a healthy individual and use that correlation as a measure of performance. And that's our smoothness of movement measure. So zero would be not smooth, one would be as smooth as, uh, as the optimal bell-shaped uh, profile. And then just like the Jepson taylor gives us some sense of speed of task execution, we selected two robotic measures that also tell us something about speed. The average number of target hits per minute, so as they move around the clock, how many targets are they acquiring, and their mean tangential speed, how quickly are they moving. And we showed throughout our um, therapy protocol that subjects improved in all of these measures. They improved clinically, and they improved with these robotic measures. But what we were most interested in is how do they map to each other. So there's a lot of stuff on this slide. I'll try and walk you through it. What we found was that the movement quality measures, the robotic measures that tried to capture the quality of movement, the smoothness, the straightness of their motions, mapped best to the motor impairment measures, the Fugelmeyer and the ARAT, that again are trying to capture the degree of motor impairment, not necessarily the speed. So in this table, we have our robotic measures across the top. This is trajectory error, smoothness, hits per minute, and mean tangential speed. And down the left-hand side are our clinical measures, Fugelmeyer, ARAT, Jepson Taylor, and the motor activity log. And so it's just to you know, match it up, you can see the correlation uh, coefficients between each pair. And the three plots down here are the three that are shaded in gray. So these were the three that were uh, moderately correlated uh, and significant. Um, so uh, the Fugelmeyer with trajectory error gave us a 0.74, ARAT was a 0.83, smoothness 0.64, and, uh, and then you sort of don't do as well with ARAT map to smoothness. But these three worked quite well. And you can see we are really spanning quite a large range of the Fugelmeyer from 22 all the way up to nearly 60. Uh, and our smoothness of movement metrics from 0.1 to 0 0.7 or so. So we're really spanning the full range of, of measurements that we would expect. And we get fairly decent correlations. So we were actually quite pleased with these. Um, we were looking just for some clinical intuition here. So it, we don't need perfect correlation. We need some good alignment. And we had a, a very wide variety of subjects. Our nine participants all had strokes in different areas of the brain, um, from the basal ganglia to the um, cerebellum, you name it. We, we had everything. And they also went from one year to 12 years post-stroke, so a huge range of time. Uh, and and they, as you can see from their Fugelmeyer scores, they were kind of all over the map. 
So this uh, was quite promising, and we thought, well, now that we can maybe um, convince clinicians that there is uh, value and intuition to be gained from these robotic measures, now we can use them. And so we've started implementing these measures with other hardware. Uh, so this is our rice wrist. Uh, for those in Waleed's group, this is our parallel manipulator, uh, the closed kinematic chain from the wrist enclosure uh, to the forearm enclosure. Um, this allows for reproduction of the natural human uh, range of motion for wrist, uh, radial ulnar deviation, flexion extension, and then forearm pronation and supination. Uh, we've shifted from stroke to spinal cord injury uh, with these studies, um, partially because of some of the initiatives of the hospital that I'm collaborating with, and, and also available funding. You know how that goes. Uh, so, uh, and this is uh, Nirai Yazbatarian, who's a physical therapist that we collaborate with. So we want to use these measures, uh, and I'll be using those measures that I discuss in some of the results that I present, so that we can have a, a more fine-grained uh, analysis of their progress through therapy. That's one way that we can provide feedback to them about their performance and motivate them to stay engaged in therapy. And in fact, they do really respond well, just anecdotally, they respond well to understanding what their scores are even in number of targets acquired, the level of resistance in the task to their scores and sort of smoothness and, and trajectory error. Another way that we can engage the participant is to um, change the way the robot interacts with them. And so we have a number of different control modes that the rice wrist can display. Um, we use an impedance controlled positioning to take them to a home position and then uh, the therapist can select a target position and a way of interacting. So we have three different control modes. We have a passive mode, uh, passive from the perspective that the patient is passive, the robot is active. Then we have a triggered mode and a constrained mode. So in the passive mode, the therapist would set the start and end positions and the robot just carries you right back and forth for a set number of repetitions and speed. In the triggered mode, uh, we use impedance control to represent a virtual wall that you have to push against. Once you hit a, a desired threshold force, again set by the therapist, the robot detects that you've hit that threshold and the robot will take over and complete the movement. And then you have to trigger the movement to return back to the start position. And then once the subject can uh, successfully use the triggered mode, the therapist pushes them into the constrained mode, which is a constant uh, engagement of the motion from start to finish. So you're continuously pushing against a viscous field, uh, again with a, a level of resistance set by the therapist and determined by the therapist. And so you would feel that force resistance uh, throughout the, mo the movement. Uh, our therapist that we work with is always trying to get people from passive mode to triggered to constrained by sort of assessing where they're at, understanding what they can uh, conduct in terms of their therapy session on any given day. So in this way that we can make sure that they're engaged and they're not just passive because when they're passive the literature shows that the outcomes aren't very good. So here's a video showing some of those interactions with the rice wrist. So this study was just uh, some pilot work done in my lab. Uh, the subject here uh, was a 26-year-old male, suffered a um, motocross accident. Uh, and this was six months post-injury. He does not have that many tattoos. He knew he was being videotaped, so he put a bunch of temporary tattoos on that day. <laughs> uh, he's he's a, a, a great uh, participant to work with. Um, he lacks some grip strength, so we um, uh, have him Nope. Uh, we have him uh, wrapped in the device. All right, so you're seeing some of the, the movements. Okay, I clearly didn't test the video the whole way through. There we go. Um, so here you're seeing wrist flexion extension. Um, you'll see some other shots of radial ulnar deviation and then the forearm pronation supination. Right now, although we have the ability to do coordinated movements, we've taken an approach where we just address one joint at a time. Um, and the therapist makes the decision as to how she wants to progress through. Um, this is your uh, radial ulnar deviation. Uh, there is good literature to show that breaking down the movements into these individual degrees of freedom is beneficial for therapy, that training the coordinated movement is not necessarily going to lead to the best outcomes. Uh, so we've been happy with this approach. I want to give you just a sense of the kinds of outcomes that we see. So Randy participated in a, uh, a two-week uh, protocol five days a week for a couple hours each day. And Jepson Taylor was our primary clinical uh, um, assessment. So uh, right 
side and left side, he had pretty significant different uh, functional, uh, functional ability. So pre, he was unable to complete most tasks with his right hand. Here's the functional tasks that I was describing, page turning, lifting objects, simulated feeding, stacking checkers, etc. Um, but post, he was able to complete at least, you know, five, uh, five cards in 150 seconds, um, two objects in 180 seconds. Um, and then on the left side, again, the measures are in seconds, so his times all um, speed up. He becomes faster at executing all of these movements. And this was interesting to us, but we were more interested in what those robotic measures would tell us. Would they give us sort of more insight into the task? This is the kind of data we get back. So this is the smoothness of his movements for forearm pronation and supination pre-training and post-training. This lightly dotted line would be the optimally smooth velocity profile for this task. The uh, diamond uh, plot is his actual velocity profile before and after. And uh, the factor that we compute goes from a 0.16 to a 0.54 on a scale of 0 to 1. Now at this point, we're really just reporting these measures. Um, but you can imagine now taking this data and using this in a feedback loop where you would adjust the robot's uh, contribution to the task, not based on the therapist like uh, observations and assessments, but based on the actual performance of the task as measured in these, uh, with these robotic measures. We saw these gains on every degree of freedom uh, with the robot supination, pronation, flexion, extension, radial deviation, and ulnar deviation. And this was session two to session 10. From that uh, pilot study, we moved to our full arm uh, exoskeleton. This is the Mahi XO2. Uh, we had a different version, that was the X01. Um, so this device is the same platform for wrist that I just showed you, and it includes a degree of freedom for elbow flexion extension. So again, they're doing center outreaching tasks, and the therapist is selecting the interaction mode, that passive, triggered, or constrained mode, and setting all the threshold values. Uh, this subject um, also incomplete spinal cord injury at like the C2 level. Uh, and she was uh, more chronic. She was about 12 months post-injury. Um, and uh, again, very uh, significant differences from right side to left side. She's actually using the constrained mode here, where she's initiating the movement and, and extending all the way through the range of motion and then flexing all the way through the range of motion. In other uh, movements that are on the right side, she might be using a passive mode or a triggered mode because of the differentiated ability. Uh, with this uh, participant, we looked at uh, different clinical measures. Again, ASIA, upper extremity motor score, ARAT, and the Jebson Taylor. Uh, again, right and left, pre and post. And we see um, moderate improvements on the more affected side and larger improvements on the less affected side. I'll come back to this theme in a minute. Um, but, but basically, those who have higher function show more improvement with our uh, interaction modes. And it's really when they're operating in that constrained, uh, interaction mode where they're pushing through the range of motion that we see the most benefit. Here's some examples of her results uh, pre and post for forearm supination, radial de uh, deviation, and wrist extension. So again, all the movements are becoming smoother. We feel like this gives us much more insight into the changes that are taking place than just the scores or times to complete task. So where are we going? Uh, we're developing some adaptive controllers that will do this assessment of the individual um, executing the task um, and trying to infer their ability to complete the movements independently in real time. So no longer will the therapist be saying, okay, for the next 300 trials, you're gonna use this setup. The robot is going to adapt. We've implemented this adaptive controller in the lab. We've run it on the graduate student who designed the adaptive controller. And we're planning a clinical evaluation of this uh, assist as needed type controller so that we can really continuously push for the engagement of the subject. We can also push for the engagement of the subject through the design of our mechanisms. So this is our uh, series elastic rice wrist. Um, it's the same parallel design, so everything in green and dark blue is the same as the previous design. What's new and improved is this little module right in here, the uh, cyan color with the red. So I'll give you some more d details on the hardware in a second, but just some background and motivation for this uh, approach of designing a compliant mechanism. We know that rehab robotics should ideally be pure force sources. We want minimal intrinsic mechanical impedance. We want them to be able to back drive these robots and feel as if they're doing free motion. And we want to be able to implement interaction control. We're really concerned most with how the human and the robot are interacting together. 
um, and able to implement that interaction control, uh, you need good force sensing, uh, which doesn't match well with sort of robot design and available force sensors. So force sensors are noisy, uh, you get uh, non-co-location of the sensor and the actuator, you have all these sort of control issues that pop up that are really undesirable. Um, but you can, uh, if you had a way to estimate force forces, then you could uh, implement this interaction control uh, using these same control strategies. Similarly, we know that wrist joint dynamics are dominated by stiffness, and it would be great if our wrist rehab robots uh, could be programmable springs of sorts uh, to promote this natural motor recovery. So we're adopting this series elastic actuation architecture so that we can match both the requirements of back drivability of the device, capability of force feedback, because we're going to turn the force control problem into a position control problem, and then we have this intrinsic compliance, which gives us this really nice and natural interaction between the subject and the robot. So here's our, our magic little component. This is our series elastic uh, element. What you've got is um, two springs, a compression spring and an extension spring packaged between these two plates. This is quite small. This is a quarter here. Uh, and then for displacement sensing, we're using a Hall effect sensor. So non-contact position sensing for the overall extension of the, of the mechanism. With that Hall effect sensor, now we know the displacement of the spring. We know the spring stiffnesses. Therefore, we know the forces. And uh, it, this is just a plot of force uh, versus Hall effect uh, sensor voltage, so voltage on the y-axis and the measured force on the x-axis. And this is a bit of a hysteresis analysis, so extension here, compression, extension, compression. And we have very good linearity uh, with this system. So we're implementing this series elastic on a single degree of freedom, and we've done some early analysis for interaction control implementation with the system. Uh, and then we're prototyping to incorporate this uh, compliance into the full wrist exoskeleton so we can evaluate that clinically as well. And uh, as a further um, push in this direction, uh, we'll be developing an MRI compliant version of the Rice wrist so that we can do some functional MRI studies uh, with the robot that we use for treatment as the same rob robot that we're using in the MRI. Uh, we get good force control bandwidth with blocked output with this device as well, up to about 10 hertz, uh, which is more than sufficient for the frequency of human motion. All right, so I'm going to wrap up our topic on rehabilitation and shift gears to uh, using haptic guidance for training new skills. Um, so I'm going to focus on two aspects. One is task analysis and uh, strategy determination. So you have a new motor skill that you want to train somebody to do. And uh, you need to understand what the underlying strategy or approach to complete that task should be. And then how do you implement or train somebody using a haptic device in a virtual environment to adapt those strategies and complete that uh, task. So this work, uh, again, a, a set of uh, current and former students and postdocs. And my main collaborator on this is Mike Byrne, who's in the psychology department at Rice, and also computer science, who's an expert in human-computer interaction. So a little backstory and motivation. Uh, I'm really interested in dynamic tasks, so tasks that require users to interact with objects that have intrinsic dynamics. And such tasks require online movement planning and adaptation in response to feedback. So you're sort of doing maybe an internal model formulation, and you've got some feedback from your sensors, and you're trying to modify your model of the task and how you should execute that task. We also know that many dynamic tasks have optimal strategies for completion that may make you uh, time efficient, uh, reduce error, reduce variability, uh, which would in turn result in, in better outcomes. And if you study sort of the motor learning uh, motor training literature, there's three phases. There's training and practice and execution. So the tasks that I'm most interested in are those that you ultimately have to do independently. So uh, you can imagine uh, driving an SUV uh, without rollover protection. You can learn how to drive uh, to avoid flipping the SUV, but now rollover prevention controls are implemented in almost every vehicle, and so you really you know, can be less concerned about this. You don't have to learn to do it without. You always have those 
sort of training wheels in place. Um, <clears throat> we're really interested in tasks that ultimately you have to do on your own. So she's going to be a pro golfer someday. She needs to learn how to swing the golf club effectively and efficiently with uh, high performance. And traditionally, this type of training for dynamic tasks has been human mediated, sometimes physically me mediated, sometimes verbally, instructions, or you know, if you're in medical school, see one, do one, teach one, right? So you watch others and then you pick up that skill. We have uh, the sense from rehabilitation robotics that robot-mediated training offers many potential advantages. As I said, we can do this high intensity and repetition. We get all this data so we can analyze your performance. Uh, and so by robot-mediated, we're going to look at interaction with haptic devices. But some of the drawbacks are we don't really know how best to implement this kind of training. Right? We know it really well for human-mediated training, but for robot-mediated training, We've had quite variable success. In fact, the biggest clinical study with the Locomat, this system showed no significant improvement in, in outcomes for overground walking um, after training. And there's a lot of reasons why we think that is the case, um, but it's sort of a work in progress. In all of these applications, our goals are to improve low performers, accelerate uh, training and improve retention. So uh, this would be me probably on the low, on the red line here. You know, maybe I can get myself to ultimately uh, be better in performance at a task than I would be otherwise without this intervention. Um, we, we have some natural high performers that we just can't really make any better. They're just naturally good at tasks. And maybe you have these other uh, subjects who, with training, would eventually achieve the performance of a high performer. Maybe we can get them there faster. So this is of interest to the military uh, in uh, surgical training because residency times have been decreased significantly in the U.S. Uh, surgeons in training are getting many fewer hours uh, learning new skills. So how can we be most efficient with our delivery of training? So another way I like to think about this, and maybe it's because I'm trying to teach my kids how to ride their bikes without training wheels, is that there's sort of ways that we learn tasks. Right? One way is uh, demonstration by an expert. In the literature, this is called record and play. Right? So uh, this is, would be my child, blue child, watching me ride my bicycle, thinking about themselves riding a bicycle, and then they go and try it. Right? Prone to failure, uh, maybe you're not really learning um, the best way to do the task, but you get this, uh, in a virtual environment, you get this sort of safe uh, practice. And you can you know, impose some constraints uh, in doing that. <clears throat> safe practice would be with training wheels, which is what they've been doing. Um, in the uh, virtual reality literature, these are called virtual fixtures. So you put these sort of virtual walls and constraints in the environment, and you keep them in a safe uh, safe workspace, right? So you never let them go into the workspace where they will fail. And uh, surprisingly, this doesn't work great, right? Take the training wheels off my kids' bicycles last weekend, and they fall over. Because they've never experienced those dynamics out of that range. Right? So you really need to let them explore that and know how to respond to it. And that's why uh, the bicycles with no pedals now are quite popular. So that now they sell the bicycles with, without pedals, and you just sort of scoot along, and you learn the dynamics of the bicycle, and you might really feel the whole workspace of the bicycle. And then you put the pedals on, and you know how it's supposed to feel. You've never been constrained to that safe environment. What we are really interested in is active intervention, so sort of a happy medium between the training wheels and the scooter bike, where now the expert is going to assist uh, in training. Right? So this was me hunched over chasing the kids on the bicycle last weekend, and this worked. Right? So you get them to get the feel, you sort of ease off how tightly you're holding onto the bicycle, how much you're helping their support, and they kind of get the feel for it, and what do you know, they're, they're pedaling off and I'm holding my breath. Right? So, this active intervention is really what we want to implement in our virtual environments, but how do we do that effectively, especially when it might be a different kind of inter intervention for each task? So here's our overall objective. We want to design a haptic guidance scheme that will improve their motor skill acquisition, convey key task performance skills, and ideally reduce or maintain workload. We don't want our training environment to be more taxing cognitively than just uh, doing the task on its own. And so we evaluate our haptic guidance schemes by comparing them to other schemes. And here's the basic block diagram. So for a virtual environment task that you're training, the human interacts with a haptic device where we can sense position and velocity where they want to be. 
and we provide those states to the virtual environment and we generate haptic feedback so they can feel how the bicycle feels in virtual reality. What we want to add to this, right, so we might haptically augment that task, kind of simulate the training wheels or simulate the uh, active guidance on the back of the bicycle and provide that haptic feedback as well so they get some summation of the task forces and the guidance forces. Or maybe we use another modality. Maybe we provide a visual cue that tells them about how they should execute the task. Or maybe we provide better written instructions. So there's a lots of ways that you can incorporate guidance. And uh, inherent to all of them, though, is understanding what are the key task performance skills. I'm going to tell you the rest of this segment in reverse of how the work actually happened. So what happened, uh, the, the short story is, we tried this, we designed our haptic guidance, we tried actually this one, designed our haptic guidance to what we, th we thought was most important for the task, implemented it, it was worse than practice. Right? If we had just left them alone, they would have been much better at learning the skill that we were trying to train. Instead, we fiddled, we meddled, and disaster. Right? Why? Well, what we did from that point was go back and assess that task. What's really important? What are experts in that task really doing? So we did some motion analysis, figured out what they were doing, then designed the guidance for that task. And it didn't matter how we provided the guidance. Since we were providing the right cues, we could provide them haptically. We could provide them visually. We could provide them written. And everybody did great, which was an interesting result, but not quite the result we were going for. Since I'm a haptics person, I wanted the haptic guidance to work best. It didn't. Um, so now I'm maybe a, a, a non-believer in haptic guidance for training, uh, but we start now with assessing the task. So we design a task and then we try and get at underlying uh, features of the task, what's most important, and then if we, we assume that if we provide feedback about those strategies for completing the task rather than just your score, then you'll improve at the task more effectively. So that's how it actually happened. I'm going to tell you in reverse the way it should be done. Right? So some of the challenges, we need tasks to be sufficiently complex so that you have multiple sessions for training. If it's an easy task, you might as well just practice. Uh, we need to design guidance so that the subject avoids dependence, like the training wheels, right? You don't want them to be t dependent on the guidance. It's a different task than when you take those training wheels away. And we need to understand what performance measures are most important, and we really need to evaluate those performance measures. They could be performance measures that tell us about your execution of the task. It could also be performance measures about your cognitive workload or other um, ways of assessing performance. So our most recent effort has been looking at sensors in low-cost gaming controllers for um, motion assessment. So we are using um, Nintendo Wii remotes with the Motion Plus 3-axis gyro on the bottom. We've also used uh, Sony's 6-axis uh, uh, game controllers. And we've developed our own uh, novel virtual environment for a, a dynamic task. Um, we've done some comparison of these two, and they're equally suitable. Uh, there's many more tools for getting data off a of Wii, so that's what we're using now for, for this study. The novel task environment is, a, is an open source environment called Neverball. It's kind of like the game Monkey Ball. I don't know, if, I don't know what it is in Swedish. Uh, but the, basically what you're doing is you're uh, modifying the orientation of the remote to change the orientation of the world. So you're tipping uh, and changing the orientation of this half pipe, basically. And as you change the orientation of that half pipe, this ball rolls. And what you want to happen is the ball to roll up to this side, collect those coins, back to this side, collect those coins, and back and forth as you move down the half pipe. Once you collect enough coins, the goal opens up and you want to go to the goal. <laughs> so the score is some combination of the time to execute this task and the number of coins that you collect. It's really hard, and I'm horrible at this task. All right, so it's a task that takes several sessions to train, uh, which is important. We want um, there to be multiple sessions to show that people can improve on this task. We don't want it to be too easy. Uh, we have other levels that were impossible. No one ever got better. They were just too difficult. And so we tested a number of these different levels, and the half pipe was our favorite. So here's a progression of one subject uh, versus trials. And we like this because it takes two sessions to train, which is not too many for a human subject study. The human subjects can be expensive. 
So what we observed in this task, um, there were some features in our design that we were really interested in. We wanted a dynamic and rhythmic task. I'm interested in tasks that have some inherent frequency component. This relates to sort of the prior work we had done. And so what you need to do is to get the, the ball rolling in this half pipe back and forth at the right frequency to collect all the coins and roll towards the goal. Um, it also requires smooth execution of movements and control of the remote and very precise and small movements. Um, and it's a bit open-ended. So we weren't sure exactly what it took to do this task well and we poured over data for nearly a year trying to come up with the right measures that would capture skill. And those measures that we honed in on were two. One was the mean absolute jerk. So jerk is the derivative of acceleration. Again, relates to the smoothness of movements. So the mean absolute jerk of the subject's movements over the course of the trial, and then the average frequency of their movements. So how were they oscillating back and forth as they collect those coins? And this is the plot of successes in purple and failures in green. Right? And what you see is that successes do pretty much fall along a line here. And the successful trials had a correlation coefficient of 0.73. And failures tend to fall down here. Uh, it's really hard to induce uh, movements that have low frequency and high jerk. So you don't see ma very many people up in this region. Okay. And we thought, well, OK, this is interesting. Um, what's making uh, some people succeed and some people fail? Well, it seemed like there was this good combination of your frequency and your jerk measurements that would lead to success in the task. And it got even more interesting than that because we were looking at this saying, well, there's some green data points that look really well correlated to this line. What's going on there? And so uh, my student, Neil, who was working on this, um, dug down a little further and found that these subjects fell into about three groups. We have our black group, our pink group, and our blue group. And if you notice these groups, they seem, seem to have like a sweet spot where they operate along this uh, linear regression line. So the black solid triangles here are the successes of those subjects that he named strategy one. So they adopted one range of frequency and jerk combination. And when they failed, they're the black triangles over here. They're mostly out of their region. So they have some failures that are failures because they're not close to the linear regression, but some failures because they're trying to operate in a region that's outside their comfort zone. Right? And if you look at the pink group, all of their successes are clustered kind of in this middle region, and their failures are sometimes in the middle region, but a lot of times off the linear regression, but also when they get outside their comfort zone. And then this blue group, which is really only about two subjects, the, the pink group had the most number of subjects, the blue group had two subjects, and again, their successes are all up here for the most part, and their failures are, are few. This was a highly successful group, um, but also sort of when they deviated farther from the line. We had the, the least uh, ability to predict failure with this blue group. So what he did was he used half the data to uh, come up with a prediction model and the other half the data to assess those predictions and found that he could, uh, with like 70% success, predict success for a strategy one group and with 83% success well, with 83% uh, of the time he could predict failure of that group. And for the middle group, 97% of the time he could predict a successful trial. And 50% of the time he could predict that they would fail, just based on the values of their average frequency and mean absolute jerk. So where are we going with this? What we want to do uh, from here is start computing these metrics, these mean absolute, free, uh, free, mean absolute jerk and, and average frequency in real time for the task. And instead of saying your score on this trial was an 80, we want to say, hey, you need to modify your input frequency. You need to speed up your movements a little or slow down your movements a little. You need to smoothen your movements more. And we feel that with this more precise instruction about how they need to execute the task, that we'll get them to improve more quickly. So that is sort of the, the next stage. We did this similar analysis uh, for a virtual target hitting task. This was um, where actually where we started. Um, in this task, they're using that same joystick that we used for the stroke study and trying to basically make a, a ball on a rubber band hit these uh, opposing targets. All right, so here's their 
that their uh, position is black and this object that they're controlling is purple and it's kind of like a if you've played the game with the paddle and the ball on the rubber band that you try and bounce uh, you're trying to, to keep the ball kind of hitting the targets but here you're swinging it back and forth maybe like a yo-yo would be another example so your, your object here is to uh, basically excite this second object so that it hits these targets in opposition. When subjects start this task, they move around like this. And when they get very good at this task, their movements look like this straight line. So we looked at this kind of data and we said, OK, we're going to design a haptic guidance algorithm. And we're going to constrain them to the path. And they get a little bit better, but they never get as good as the people who are just naturally good. We thought, what's going on here? So we started looking again at the experts, the people who do this task the best. So our high performers start with very many hits, and they get a little bit better. And our low performers start off pretty pitifully, and they get a little bit better, but not much. And then we have this other group that starts out low and figures it out. Well, we looked at the time series data, trying to really understand what are these performers doing when they uh, execute this task. So each of these three plots are displacement versus time. And displacement of the user uh, in the dark black and displacement of the mass that they're trying to hit the target. And so a novice is sort of, okay, I'm going to go down and try and hit this target and then I'm going to go up and try and hit that target and then I miss that target so I'm going to stay down here and try and hit that target and I finally hit the target so I go back to the other one. Somebody who's kind of in the middle figures out that this system has a natural frequency. Right? We set a spring stiffness and a damping ratio for the system and if, the, if they find the frequency of the system they can kind of just go back and forth and well, every now and then they miss one and they try and go back and hit it and here they missed one and they try and go back and hit it. But for the most part they found that there's a rhythm to this task. And the experts are over here. And they found not just that the system has a frequency, but they've isolated the natural frequency of the system. And so their input becomes very small. Their movements are quite tiny. And they've uh, excited the system at resonance, and they're hitting the targets. And if they miss a target, they don't care. Right? They, I'll get it the next time. Right? And so you can look in the time series and see that, yes, you do want to constrain uh, the subject to maybe a narrow band, but there's a frequency component here that we were ignoring. And so we do a, a, a power spectrum and you see that low performance have a peak frequency at 0.2 hertz, mid-range performers have a peak at 0.78 hertz, and our, our, our all-stars here peaked at about 0.95. That's about the resolution of us computing the, the frequency. So they're right on the natural frequency, which was one hertz for this system. So now we know there's two things that are important. And in fact, you can plot the experts versus novices against these other metrics. And you'll see that the novices uh, in blue start out with low frequency and get higher. And they start out with high um, error from that straight line trajectory and get better. And these experts just know. They kind of have this intuition about the task right away, that I need to use the dynamics of the task to execute it well. The other interesting thing about these two measures is that they're independent. So our uh, outcome of the task is how many targets can you hit. Um, if you correlate trajectory error, how straight line are their movements to the number of hits, highly correlated. If you keep your uh, mass on the line, you're going to hit more targets. And if you excite near the natural frequency compared to hits, you're going to hit more targets. But you can do these things independently, right? So you can be at the natural frequency, but be in sort of an elliptical motion, right? And then you can be um, on the straight line, but at a much lower frequency. So you kind of need both of these things independently to do the task well. And when we figured that out, and then we designed guidance that actually captured those uh, aspects, then no matter how we presented that guidance information that was really fundamental to the execution of the task, everybody improved. Not a, not a great exciting result for a paper. <laughs> Everybody gets better. Uh, nothing is significant. Um, but it was interesting that knowing what was the key to the task was most important. So here's the visual guidance that we used. Here's the two active targets. The blue here is trying to show them the channel to move in. And the green bar oscillates back and forth at the frequency. So if you keep yourself in this little part where they intersect, then you track at the right frequency, in the right channel, 
uh, and you do the task better. We also implemented those same kinds of channels haptically. Right? It's just hard to show you that on a slide. And uh, what happens is as your performance improves, either you move towards the natural frequency or you keep your error to a minimum, the saliency of these visual cues will be decreased. Right? And it looks like this. Right? So they disappear over time. Or similarly, the haptic guidance disappears. Right? So the gains disappear. So the way this is implemented, again, here's your human operator controlling your haptic device. We're measuring position and velocity, which drives the system dynamics of the two-mass system. We use those states of the two-mass system to figure out how our guidance controller is going to act. So the guidance controller is doing two things. There's these virtual walls that keep you in the channel, and then there's a spring that's pulling you, uh, basically a proportional trajectory controller that's pulling you along the path that we want. And uh, we can compute those system forces by the dynamics of the virtual system. And then we have a tracking controller, again, a PD uh, tracking controller, very standard. Uh, we have a wall force, uh, so it's a very stiff virtual wall. And then the total force that you feel is uh, your own input plus the um, uh, tracking controller, the walls, and the task itself. And then <clears throat> we have gains on these, either the wall force gain or the tracking force gain that we can turn down, right? Turn the knob down as you get better on those independent measures. And in fact, this is what it looks like over time. Um, you can see the, the algorithm that we have. Uh, as you improve over sessions, the gain goes almost to zero. So by the end of training, you're not reliant on those training wheels anymore. The training wheels have gone away, and you're doing the task on your own, which is our objective. And this is... <laughs> So this is what we found. No significant differences. These are the four groups. So one group that practiced, uh, uh, one group that was a little bit worse, but not significantly worse, one group that got um, haptic guidance, one group that got visual guidance, and one group that got written instructions as to what the specific strategies were for the task. All right, last section. And this is the shortest one. Um, some, some recent work that we've gotten into is looking at uh, how haptic feedback can be useful in control of a prosthetic limb. So we're interested uh, in natural sensory feedback. So many approaches in prosthetics have used sensory substitution, so using maybe auditory cues or providing a tactile cue somewhere else on the body. And then the um, individual has to learn to map that feedback to the task. What we want to do is provide this sensory feedback in a very natural way. So we're looking at the role of tactile and kinesthetic feedback. And then we're analyzing the performance of two different kinds of tasks, one a positioning task and one a manual control task with these different kinds of feedback provided. So um, this is uh, work. Um, so Ozken is my most recent finished PhD student. And Ryan Christensen is a phenomenal undergraduate at Rice, has been worth with me for about two years. Um, and then my collaborators at Michigan, Drexel, and University of Houston. So here's the, here's the gist of it. If you go back in time uh, in the literature of prosthetic systems, body power prostheses were what was used most frequently. So here's a body powered prosthesis for a transradial amputee. Um, they've got a very simple mechanism, a single degree of freedom uh, gripper, and it's actuated through pulleys and ropes that go over the shoulder girdle. And so by sort of hitching your shoulder, you can actuate the gripper. And the interesting thing here is there's a nice mechanical co connection. So as the gripper closes, you feel the tension in the cable through your whole shoulder girdle. So you have inherent haptic feedback. State-of-the-art prosthetic devices are myoelectric. They use EMG electrodes on the stump to command a motor that opens and closes the gripper. This is great in terms of sort of compactness. You no longer have this whole harness here, but you've lost the physical connection. You've lost the sensory feedback. So some groups have uh, restored sensory feedback by doing what's called targeted re where you can uh, use the nerves on the, on the chest to command the gripper, and you get some sensation uh, for the um, feedback. But it's not natural, and it has to be interpreted. So if you look at an intact muscle, they have, we have this inherent uh, force-motion relationship with our effectors. So the efferent command goes down to the muscles. The muscles change in length. The grip changes in aperture. If I'm picking up an object, it induces a force. The force is sensed in the muscle. 
and that muscle spindle afferent gives me that sense of effort back. So it's a very tight, interconnected loop of action and sensory feedback. So here is our approach. We want to create a functionally biarticular muscle. So a muscle that can both uh, take, for example, the bicep. The bicep here can control the elbow joint and the positioning of the residual limb and the prosthesis. But we are also going to use that muscle with EMG to command a gripper. Now we want to restore the feedback as well. So we have four sensors on our gripper, and we can, com we can apply that force as a torque about the elbow via an exoskeleton. And similarly, we can put uh, tactile sensors here, or we can even use the, the force sensors. And we can provide uh, tactile feedback to the skin uh, to give us cues about contact. And the project starts, and all the experiments I'll show you today are with EMG to control the gripper. We're uh, at the same time, we're mining non-invasive neural recording, so we're recording EEG and FNIR to understand the neural correlates for motor adaptation. And then in the next phase of the project, in about one year from now, we'll be switching to use EEG as our input. So it'll be the brain-machine interface as opposed to the muscle-machine interface. So our first experiment that I'll describe uh, is coordination of grasp and lift. So here's our exoskeleton. Uh, the EMG electrodes are under uh, the brace. Uh, there's a motor here and a capstan transmission to provide that torque movement, uh, torque feedback with extension. Uh, this is our actuated gripper. It's large and bulky, mostly just to get the, the forces to be reasonable. There's a handle underneath here. Um, the, the gripper is, uh, is actuated. There's a load cell. And we also have a, an aperture uh, sensor, the axis encoder here. Uh, we provide feedback, kinesthetic feedback through this exoskeleton and tactile feedback through this C2 tactor, which isn't just an uh, iPod uh, nano band that goes on the arm. And so we can provide that cutaneous cue. And this tactor, we can modulate both the amplitude and frequency of the cue. And this is our test object that uh, we ask subjects to pick up. This is just printed out of ABS plastic. It has a little drawer so we can put weights in it and they can't tell how heavy the object is. And uh, there's various sensors, so we know how high the object is, we measure its weight, um, it's got some rubber grips to help with friction, it's got this little mechanism here, so it's kind of like picking up an egg, you can break the object if you squeeze too hard. We didn't use that piece in this experiment, but we have that capability for the future. And so our task is to grasp and lift this object with the gripper. So modulate your muscle activity to close the gripper on the object, pick object, set the object back down, let go and come back to rest. Uh, we did this with able-bodied participants. We had seven and three amputee participants. We did, ran this experiment last August up at um, Michigan. So the able-bodied is wearing the exoskeleton and holding the gripper, and the amputee is wearing the exoskeleton, and we can attach the gripper to the exoskeleton frame, so it's a, a very simple prosthetic device. And the uh, able amputee participants were uh, used to myoelectric control prostheses, so they were well-trained in how to do this. What you see in the plots here are the position of the object uh, above the, the table surface, the load force, how hard, I'm sorry, the, the, how heavy the object is, and the grip force, how tightly they're squeezing. And the dotted lines are the light objects and the solid lines are the heavy objects. And so you can look at the coordination of grasp and lift and you can see the modulation of grip force uh, when they sense slip. We provided three different feedback conditions to the participants. We either did no feedback, so they could only see the object, right? but they didn't know how heavy it was because they have no feedback through the device. Or we provided the kinesthetic feedback about uh, grip force, so a, a torque about the elbow proportional to how hard they're squeezing the object. Or we provided the tactile cue where the amplitude was modulated in proportion to the grip force. And then what we did was they did three trials in a row with one feedback condition and weight. So for example, you would have the no feedback condition. You would pick up the object, set it down, pick it up again, set it down, pick it up again, set it down, and then the weight would be changed and you would pick it up. But now every time we took it back so they didn't exactly know that they were getting three in a row, but that was the protocol. So three light and then three heavy, or three heavy and then three light. And so what I'm showing here is the performance uh, on the first trial after a transition from a light object to a heavy object, then the second trial after that transition, and then the third trial after that transition. And so what you would expect is if they have feedback, there might be slip when the object becomes heavier because they're not grasping it tightly enough. And if slip happens, maybe they can see it, and so they'll modulate their grip force. Or maybe they can feel it, 
um, because they have the, the force feedback either through the exoskeleton or through the tactors. And so the percent of trials that there was slip in the first, uh, the first trial after transition was not significantly different between the three feedback conditions, but you can see that there's a reduction in slip with force feedback. By the second trial, the vibrotactile was also effective at reducing slip. And by the third trial, both vibrotactile and force feedback were significantly different than the no feedback condition in terms of the uh, percent of trials where slip occurred. So both of these, vibrotactile and force, uh, were capable of providing sufficient information for the subject to learn to modulate their grip force and reduce the incidence of slip when picking up the object. Um, if uh, what we are going to do next time is use uh, vibrotactile to encode slip information rather than grip force information so that you have two different channels and you can determine uh, how you want to use that information differentially and we can provide both at the same time. So that experiment is under design right now. The second experiment that we've done with this setup is an EMG controlled virtual prosthesis. So again, EMG on the arm controlling the pose of a virtual prosthetic hand um, and the EMG signal as it crosses different thresholds will cause the hand to move into different poses. Uh, we're recording EEG and FNIR data but not, not analyzing it at this time. Uh, that's coming up in the next couple of months. Here's the tree of poses. So they're given a target pose that's either this cylindrical pose, the tip pose, or the point pose. So two, six, or seven are the target poses. And as they increase their muscle activity, as they flex, the virtual prosthetic hand moves from this opposition to tip to cylindrical pose. And as they relax, it goes back down. Or if they start in this position, as they flex, it goes to point, hook, and lateral pinch, and then as they relax, it would come back down. So when you see a target pose, you need to modulate your muscle activity to get yourself, you know, either low muscle activity or high muscle activity on, on one of these target poses. And we can provide that feedback visually, so the white is the actual pose, so he's relaxed right now, so the hand is open. Um, and then the target pose is shown in blue, it's just a blue CAD model of the hand overlaid. And so if they have visual feedback, they know their current and target. If they don't have visual feedback, they only know the target pose. Or we can provide the tactile feedback about their error between the desired and actual pose. And what we found here was that com combining visual and tactile feedback incurred minimal cost. So there were a bunch of studies that have showed, shown that tactile feedback is better than no feedback. We would expect providing some feedback would be useful. Visual feedback is better than no feedback. Visual plus tactile is better than one modality alone, but there's been no analysis of the cost of maybe incorporating both types of feedback. So we looked at time on target, so what percentage of each trial were they in the desired pose, how quickly did they respond to the cue, the visual or tactile cue, telling them that they were on target or off target, and what was their control effort in terms of the amount of EMG activity. And so none of these um, control efforts were significantly different here. Um, this is not full scale, so we're just kind of zoning in on the, on the top. And then the visual was better than none, and the visual plus tactile was better than none, and tactile was better than none, and visual was about the same as visual plus tactile. So the conclusion from this study was that while uh, that vibrotactile was viable, it was better than no feedback, which we had seen in other studies. That combined visual and vibrotactile outperformed the no feedback condition, but combined was not better than one modality. However, if you're talking about an amputee who sometimes will be able to pay visual attention to the task, but sometimes may be looking elsewhere and trying to do a task, having both modalities of feedback present would be useful. You can rely on the tactile feedback when you don't have visual attention, you can use the visual attention, you know, visual feedback when you have it, um, and you're not going to incur any additional costs. So the response time was not affected and control effort were not affected by incorporating both types of feedback. All right. Today, I've talked about three different uh, efforts in the lab in how we're using mechatronic and robotic devices to enhance human motor control, retrain, or uh, provide new capabilities. Uh, we talked a little bit about robotic rehabilitation, skill training in virtual environments, and sensory feedback for smart prosthetics. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have.
you very much, Marcy. Uh, any questions from the audience? Anika? Uh, I just had a question about the first part. Uh -huh. uh, you're talking about the three modes of um, interaction with the patient. The constraint part, where they actually have to push all the mm -hmm. things back and forth. Do you limit the path? Yes. Okay. They are constrained to the path. So the resistance is only along the path. Yeah, so I'm wondering about this uh, haptic uh, control uh, mm -hmm. for learning new skills. Mm -hmm. So what are the main challenges before we can use something like that to, say, play the piano? You should remember to repeat the question. So the question is, what are the main challenges? Right. Uh, the question is, what are the main challenges in the incorporation of haptic guidance? I think um, some of the challenges are um, the complexity of the task. Right. So you want a task that's complex enough um, that training is important um, and guidance will be important that they would maybe benefit from the guidance as opposed to just practice alone. I think also you really need to look at the type of task. So one um, study that I didn't describe today is looking at different architectures for providing guidance. So whether you provide guidance on the same hand that's executing the task, it's difficult to discern what are the task forces and what are the guidance forces. Maybe you can provide them spatially separated, right? So you're feeling the task forces on one and the guidance forces on the other. Um, and then sometimes what you can do is disturb Right, so there's a lot of work in motor control where you have perturbances when you're doing straight line movements. And if you perturb them, uh, they learn how to sort of deal with these disturbances and act against them, and you actually become better at the task. It's really task dependent. So what we found with dynamic tasks, providing the guidance forces is really beneficial, um, whereas disturbing is not beneficial. It disrupts the task too much. Whereas if you're trying to do a path following task, you know, trace a, a, a novel shape, the disturbance uh, is quite effective at getting them to be better at path following, whereas the guidance is not very useful because all you ever feel is the desired path. You never sort of learn how to deal with disturbances. So I, I don't really have a great answer except to say it's highly task dependent, um, and you really need to understand uh, what are the issues with the task you're trying to train. So dynamic tasks, I would say the active guidance is beneficial, but you need to make it adaptive so that they don't become dependent on it. And then if it's a path following or trajectory based task, any kind of noise or disturbance is good because it's going to teach them to become sort of to uh, reject those disturbances. Yes? Uh, for the pedal uh, manipulator, how many active degree of freedom Number one, and secondly, uh, for the uh, device you have shown the spring, mm -hmm. dual spring, spring uh, is that the uh, active, you can say activated device or it's a passive or active, active device? Please just give some sure. So the first question is the number of active degrees of freedom for the parallel manipulator for the wrist. So the wrist platform is a three RPS platform, three Revolut uh, prismatic spherical. So the, the mechanism has three degrees of freedom. Um, it has uh, more, um, so it has three actuators, so basically three linear actuators on the, on the three legs of the platform. Um, those degrees of freedom that you get from just that mechanism are the overall height of the platform and then two rotations, which for us map to wrist flexion extension and radial ulnar deviation. We do not use this degree of freedom during performance because that's basically the distance from the wrist to the forearm, which we wouldn't want to change actively during rehab. But we passively allow that to modulate. And you do get some variation uh, with alignment of the wrist, slight variation of that degree of freedom. Um, so I think that answers your first question. The second question on the, the um, series elastic uh, mechanism, just the mechanism, the series elastic mechanism that I showed you is passive. So we simply have the displacement measurement on the overall extension compression of the spring, but we couple that to the linear actuator portion of the, of the mechanism. I can skip back. close. Yeah. Right. So this mechanism is, is passive. This is a spherical joint. This is the spring mechanism with the um, displacement sensing. But it's bolted to this. This is just um, a carriage, a linear slide that holds a cable that wraps around that threaded rod to the motor. So that's our linear, it's a, it's a rotary um, you know, DC motor, but we turn it into a, a linear actuator. So overall, this, uh, this joint is a linear joint? Then. It's a linear joint, correct. Yeah, and we constrain it to linear motion with basically bearings. Yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned on one of your initial slides uh, something related to haptics used in tele surgery. Mm -hmm. Can you say something more about which, which scenarios it has been used? Um, so there's very little haptics used in surgical applications. Um, the two most widely known surgical robots right now, one is being used um, medically, that's the Da Vinci uh, robot by Intuitive Surgical. That has practically no haptic feedback. Right, so there's, if, if I were to go, so there's a, there's a surgical surgeon's console um, that you sit at and, and you use the manipulators and that controls the, the robots at the patient be, uh, pe bedside. Um, if I were to go over to the manipulators on the patient bedside and like really swing them, um, you would feel a little bit at the master. But they've got the gains, so it's a, you know, very low gain theorem, <laughs> right, for stability. Um, uh, the... The utility of that platform, though, is that you have stereo vision and high dexterity. So the, the master manipulator has many more degrees of freedom than traditional laparoscopic instruments, and you have a stereo view, which is uncommon. And you also don't have to do all the mental coordinate transformations that you do with laparoscopic tools. So you really feel like you're sitting there doing open surgery, and you get the scaling and some filtering of um, any tremor. The other... Um, Surgical robot is for endovascular procedures. It's by a company called Hansen. It's uh, not, I, I could be wrong. It's, I don't believe it's FDA approved yet in the US, uh, but they're doing, uh, uh, or, or certain devices are and others are not, but they're basically doing um, endovascular procedures accessed through the femoral artery with a snake-like uh, robot. Um, there is some uh, tactile feedback. Uh, haptic feedback for those that give some cues about how you're steering and some constraints uh, in the workspace. It's not exactly tactile feedback about the task that you're doing, but more the constraints of your operation. Um, so uh, we know that there's benefit in adding tactile feedback for teleoperation tasks, uh, but there's huge stability concerns, especially for medical applications. If you have any time delay, um, you get instability and you don't want that surgical application. So the companies have, have basically taken an approach where they're not addressing that because the cost to sort of prove stability um, for the purpose of FDA approval is not worth it. Um, they are so much added benefit from the stereo vision and the dexterity that they get their customers that way. Uh, I have a simple question actually, uh, similar to my friend's uh, question. Uh, about this uh, wrist and uh, training uh, skills. Uh, I believe uh, a human uh, wrist uh, has more uh, degree of freedom than uh, your mechanism. And my question is in this uh, rehabilitation uh, process, uh, do you train or recover uh, the skills after the uh, accident or whatever. Because if it's uh, recovering, well, I can uh, understand that uh, you're uh, recovering all the degree of freedom uh, for the wrist. Uh, but if it's uh, retraining from uh, scratch, uh, is the uh, human's wrist will be uh, constrained in this degree of freedom or not? Um, so the, the question is, um, because the mechanism um, constrains the degrees of freedom of the wrist uh, compared to the natural wrist, do you get basically a retraining uh, where the movements are different than they would be in a healthy individual, or are you getting recovery of function? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think if you get maybe into the nitty-gritty of the biomechanics, it's true there are some other degrees of freedom in the wrist and sort of the alignment. Um, we are focusing on the dominant um, degrees of freedom of flexion, extension, and radial ulnar deviation. Our robotic assessment is in the robot. So all of our robotic measures about smoothness and trajectory are in that same constrained mechanism, but with the robot powered down. So the movements are the ones they initiate their, themselves, they're back driving the robot, um, but they would still be constrained by the mechanism. Um, that said, the clinical assessments are outside of the robot, and the assessments are both motor impairment and function, and we are seeing improvements in those as well. Um, I don't know that we've sort of directly gotten at um, the joint level movement capabilities with the clinical assessments, but I would say it really, it's, it's a retraining, but it's a retraining of the motor pathways from the brain 
to the limb, not necessarily a retraining of how the movements are executed. So we're, we're, we're training how to coordinate that command to execution um, with the exoskeleton as a, as a mechanism to do that. Um, but we do see benefit um, beyond the joints that we're training. So it's a slightly different answer, but let me give you one anecdote. Um, what we're seeing in our rehabilitation protocol is that grip strength is improving, um, even though all they're doing is holding the handle. And the therapist thought, well, it was a kinodesis effect, that when you retrain uh, radial ulnar deviation, you get some kinodesis and that you get some increased uh, grip strength because of the coordination. Basically, when you uh, deviate this direction, you get some pinch grip. Right? Because, and, and so if we're rehabilitating this movement, we would expect some improvement in that. But that's not what we're seeing. So when, we went, when they went and assessed that, it's not a kinodesis effect. It is an actual improvement in grip strength. So now we've built a grip force sensor, and we want to track that and try and understand what's happening. But it does seem that the effect is sort of beyond the movements that we're retraining. Um, that by retraining, um, by, by addressing the impairment, uh, we're getting improvements in function, as opposed to sort of addressing the function. So uh, there was quite a lot of creativity that was going into discovering the tricks that the experts were employing in order to perform well. Is there any indication that one could automate this in some way? That would be wonderful. So <laughs> the question is, could we automate um, the discovery of how uh, experts are performing these novel tasks? Um, I, I hope so. Um, I don't really have great insight into how that would be done. So we're starting this process all over again with a new task, with this endovascular task. Uh, we're tracking um, uh, catheter movements and, and guide wire movements uh, from live fluoroscopy images um, for um, surgical residents and surgeons that are feeding these guide wires like into a simulator. And it's like we're back to square one. I mean, we look at the data. We compute all these measures. I mean, we kind of know what to look for, but we don't know what to expect to find. So we have some hunches. We talk to the surgeons. They say, oh, yeah, we think this is important. We think that is important. We've got some clinical assessments. Again, these like rated scales will tell us, well, this person's an expert and this person's not. And so we should go look at the expert data and know that that's right and look at the novice and it's not right. But then you look at the data and you're like, they look the same. So. Um, I, I think, you know, maybe some machine learning algorithms, that, that kind of approach would be beneficial, but it's still a bit of hunting. It's my, my hunch is that there's still a bit of art to it, um, and it doesn't seem to be a very fast process. So, if you have any ideas, I'd like to talk. Well, I think uh, it's going to be hard to run out of questions after such a, an exciting talk, so Thanks, we have some coffee and cake outside, and I would like to invite everybody to join us there. And uh, there is a tradition of yes. giving the speaker in Sweden a small present. Oh, so thank you. I hope you like it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Appreciate it.